Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first ever virtual Grant Thornton Budget Seminar. Um, we're actually in the same location here as many, many of you will have been in, the boardroom in City Key, but, but all a, a bit surreal. Um, I suspect at this stage many of you will have absorbed the budget details, so we're going to divide this session into two. The first segment will look at the budget and its impact on people and businesses, and then the second panel will have a look, cast the eye down the road and, and look what might be ahead. It, it was, as you probably know, a budget heavy on spending, but there were some interesting tax measures in there too, uh, and indeed a, a couple of surprises, so we'll analyze those. There is a, a Q&A function, so we will take questions at the end of each panel, so please do use the Q&A function, and we'll try and deal with as many of those questions as we can, uh, as I say, at the end of each panel. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our MC for the morning, Vincent Wall. Thanks, Peter, um, and uh, very welcome, uh, and thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, I was here earlier uh, uh, in the middle of the night, Peter, <laughs> half past six, presenting with Peter and Andrew uh, on Breakfast Business, News Talks Breakfast Business, and they had the bright idea to hold on to me uh, at that stage to, uh, to, to try and help with this webinar as well. So uh, unfortunately, you're stuck with me for the next hour, but I am delighted to say that I am surrounded by not only glamorous assistants, but very senior personnel from Grant Thornton who are going to discuss, I think, most of the issues uh, coming from yesterday's budget uh, that you'll be interested in. And as Peter referenced, we'll, we'll be dividing it into two sections. The first section, uh, panel discussion about the impact of the measures announced yesterday. And then in the second panel, uh, we'll be uh, looking ahead to the possible road uh, to the future. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. And I'm moving from uh, my right, uh, and the only person who actually went to the trouble on the male side of the fence to actually wear a tie. Well done, Jim. Uh, we have Jim Kelly, who will be talking to us about uh, the personal taxation er er area. Um, then uh, we have uh, Una Ryan, uh, otherwise known as Kate Middleton, <laughs> <laughs> who will be talking about the whole area of capital taxes and reliefs. You've met Peter uh, already, and Peter will be uh, getting into a little bit of detail about uh, some of the, the corporate measures and also, I, I think, a, a broad overview uh, response to yesterday's uh, budget. Jarlath O'Keefe on Peter's left, who will be uh, talking to us about the whole area of, of, of indirect taxation. And then joining us from Belfast, patiently over there, Andrew Webb, Chief Economist with Grant Thornton. And we might start with you, in case you're feeling lonely over there, Andrew. We might start with you to bring you in first. Um, Oh, just before we do that, as, as Peter referenced the Q&A function, just how you actually get the questions to us. And we will have five or six minutes at the end of each panel for questions. Uh, so you have a question and answer function there on the right-hand side, little box there on the right-hand side of your screen. So literally click in there and just type in your questions and they'll come to us and we'd be delighted to get them <coughs> and pass as many as possible on to our panelists. Uh, right, Andrew, sorry, second false start, second time round. Not much spending uh, yesterday's budget, uh, as we probably expected, and light on, on uh, not much spending, not much tax measures, lots of spending. How do you assess the overall Im economic impact for the country? Uh, Peter referenced it earlier as a brave budget. Do you think so? Uh, good morning. I, th I think it was a brave budget. Um, certainly, that's, uh, there's a significant uh, allocation of cash in this budget, and uh, acceptance that there's a significant amount of borrowing to be undertaken so deficits of 20 billion plus over this year and, ne and next year uh, certainly is suggesting a okay we seem to have temporarily lost andrew there as uh, certainly according to my screen while we're waiting to get him back we might come to you una um <coughs> the whole area of capital capital uh, gains taxes you know, and very allowances. negative oh environment space that, that has that's had a devastating effect to the economy and the assumption is that that will continue with us for a period of time and, and the assumption underlying the the announcements yesterday was that there there's no immediate uh, side of a of a vaccination being rolled out imminently so that's part of the context and also a, a context of a, a messy brexit and th both of those things i think they've taken a, a particularly and appropriately negative view on it because that l then lays the context for how do you address that and really they're trying to tread a line between that very negative context but also providing hope and comfort to not just business but consumers and the various measures they've taken are hopefully going to bridge um, many businesses through this period but we're facing in the economy an economic context in the next year that's that's 
I, I was going to say forecast, but I think best guessed to decline, you know, six percent next year, uh, maybe more. It's it is best endeavors for forecasters at the minute in terms of where, where the economy is heading. But you know, the labour market in particular is set for a very difficult time, and mm. you know, hundreds of thousands of potential jobs there are at risk. So, bravery, yes. Um, you know, we could talk about the the scale of interventions, and could it have been more? I think. Uh, you know, that would be nitpicking a little bit, and there's always there's always opportunity to come back and and, and offer more in uh, in terms of intervention. But you know the the largest budget in state history, I would I would suggest, and probably one that the ministers didn't want to be announcing, given the you know the, the context in which it's in. Yeah, if I picked up I, I, as I referenced earlier on on, on the program, Una, um, I never saw such unanimity of positive response uh, from. Uh, I think firms like yourselves from, from business advocacy groups, broadly speaking, uh, a very positive response to yesterday's budget. If there was one area of disappointment, I think uh, it was that nothing was done on the capital gains tax side. W w were you disappointed as well? Yeah, I suppose we looked um, at the budget, or we, we anticipated the budget um, in both dread and um, anticipation that something would change in it. Dread that the capital taxes rates would probably increase. Um, it would have been an easy target for revenue, specifically when they said that they weren't going to increase any of the income tax rates. Um, they didn't. Capital gains tax still remains at the current rate of 33%. However, we did um, want a reduced rate of capital gains tax. Um, as you're, as you're aware from last year, I had said that we are the third highest rate of CGT in Europe, uh, Denmark being 42%. Uh, France 34 and then Ireland joined third with um, Finland at 33%. Um, so we were hoping for a reduced rate um, of CGT for about 20 at about 20% and we felt that um, this would encourage um, and stimulate the economy for entrepreneurs to um, actually make decisions now and actually uh, sell assets or sell their business. Um, failing that we were hoping then for um, a quick one year reduced rate of CGT and that one year rate of CGT at 20% we were hoping would um, encourage entrepreneurs to make fast decisions because sometimes entrepreneurs don't make such fast decisions while if you had a one year at a reduced rate of 20% that would facilitate faster decision making it would also facilitate um, getting rid of a lot of dead weight assets that would have been lying around um, at, so that entrepreneurs even sellers could take advantage of that 20% reduced rate and then I suppose we had looked at the various um, international evidence and it had shown that when you have reduced rates or you reduce the rate dramatically, it does increase um, revenue to the exchequer and it does stimulate an economy into action. And that's probably what we do need to see, especially in these COVID times where I suppose entrepreneurs, investors are just a slight bit cautious because we don't know. And as Andrew articulated, the vaccine is not forthcoming as quickly as we had hoped. Um, and we do need more money into the Exchequer to build up now this 7.75 billion, billion spending um, requirement. So yeah, we, we did look at it. I suppose we were happy that the CGT rate didn't change, that it still remained at 33%, but we were hoping for a reduced rate of CGT. And we felt that there could have been a little bit done around that. Mm. Yeah. Coming to you, Jim, not much change on the income tax front either. And I suppose that was well signaled and, and not unexpected. But there were some further tweaks, uh, an increase to the self-employed credit and some provisions for remote workers, if you want to talk us through those changes. Yeah, Vincent, you're right. There was, there was very little, <coughs> it was well flagged ahead of time that tax rates, income tax rates weren't going to change, income tax credits weren't going to change. The credit you referenced there, the earned income credit, um, it was well flagged that that would change. It's in the programme for government, so it was fully expected that that would be equalised with the POIE credit because that's been a long-term project. And it's now from next year going to be the at the same level as PAYE workers get at 1,650. The remote working piece uh, was less flagged and it was interesting. So what the Minister actually said was that he's setting up a, an interdepartmental committee to look at the whole area and see what can be done. But in the meantime, he referenced uh, some reliefs that are already there and that there's revenue guidance on, which is for e-workers, people working remotely and, and obviously there's vast cohorts at the moment that are working remotely. So the refer reference that he made was to the fact that um, utility bills, broadband bills, and possibly other expenses that are wholly exclusively and necessarily incurred 
um, meeting the, the test for deductibility can already be claimed in 2020 from the revenue. So while on the one hand, he's referenced the fact that a, a committee has been set up to look at the area and see what can be done, he's pointed to the fact that there are some reliefs already there. Yeah, th and there is, a, there is a, an allowance already available from employers should they want to pay it on a daily basis to their employees. But That's right, yeah. is there a feeling perhaps that, you know, most people working from home are, are in this situation uh, and you, it's going to be that actually claiming these reliefs, trying to work out how much broadband they're using for business purposes as distinct from, from personal use, it's all a bit bureaucratic. Might a, might a flat rate relief might have been a little bit easier to use? Certainly, I think so, because it's, it's you know, he referenced the fact that employers can reimburse at the rate of three, three or 20 a day without any benefit and kind tax, and that's an existing provision. But where the employer doesn't make a reimbursement, you're quite right, the, the employee then has to try to get their head around, well, what element of utility bills and what's the marginal cost from the fact that, that, that they're working remotely uh, and indeed broadband costs. I mean, most people have broadband anyway, so is there any incremental cost for the, for the employee? But then if people are working from home, obviously light and heat, particularly this time of the year, there's going to be additional cost. The exercise, and I think Revenue's guidance does give a couple of worked examples where, you know, the number of days worked uh, from home, taking the full utility costs uh, for the year into account and working it out on a day's basis uh, and putting a reasonable um, proposal to revenue as to what the appropriate credit might be is probably going to be acceptable. Mm, interesting to see how many people actually avail of that and, and go to the trouble of doing so. Jarlath, uh, indirect taxes, um, not an awful lot happening. The, the, I suppose the biggest change was the reduction in VAT for the broad hospitality sector. Again, pretty well signaled, but they didn't have to go down that road. What, what do you think the impact will be? Well, initially, Vincent, the impact will be, will, will be very little because of the, the COVID restrictions and until lockdown is, uh, measures are relaxed, it will have very little impact. Because you, you don't get fat unless your people are spending. Exactly, and people <laughs> aren't coming in. So mm. it, it, it is, it's a well-tested uh, measure that has been used before. After the last financial crisis, we introduced a 9% rate for the hospitality sector. It created 180,000 jobs, raised a lot of, of tax. So it is something that we know does work and will work. This time, the thinking is not to create jobs, but to sustain the jobs that are already in that sector. So it is a positive move. I thought the government could have been a little bit bolder. I thought one of the key pillars of uh, tourism is the car hire sector. I thought they could have reduced that to the 9% rate as well. And in fact, I thought they could have um, aligned our rate at the 5% along with the, the rate in the north. Um, just in terms of, of competition, particularly for border counties. So it's, it's a good measure. Um, I thought it could have been a bit bolder, but it, it's a positive step. Is there a broad acknowledgement out there that basically this VAT reduction will be absorbed by the businesses and, and won't be passed on to consumers whenever consumers start can go to those businesses again? I think so. I think it's inevitable, and I think the government have, have signposted that as well, that they see that as, as an incentive for the businesses themselves to help preserve um, their, their, their profitability. Um, so yes, I, I do agree with that. Peter, your broad, your broad response uh, after a night's sleep uh, to, the, to the general tenets of the budget and what, what little elements of, of, of corporate tax changes were out there? Yeah, Vincent, on the corporate tax side, there wasn't an awful lot. In the budget, we weren't expecting an awful lot. You know, unless it was like, had to be done for COVID, it wasn't going to be in the, in the budget. And we're not expecting uh, to that end much more in the finance bill. It'll be light other than what has to be done. Uh, he did uh, reaffirm, he always does, the commitment to the 12.5% tax rate. That's positive. Um, he did extend out the do knowledge you, do development. You, do you, do you, does that need to be reaffirmed every, every year as far as you're concerned? Does. Yeah, I think at this stage it does because he's done it for so many years. If he didn't do it, the <laughs> other way he hadn't done it. So mm. You'd almost read more into that. So for that reason alone, yeah, he, he has to do it. Um, he did, as I say, he did extend out the knowledge development box out by two years. Uh, maybe he could have extended it for more. Um, that is valuable relief, does promote research and development activities, gives you a six and a quarter percent tax rate on the profits from those activities. Really low uptake. Only 30 companies have claimed that to date. And does that need to be tweaked in any way to encourage more in, or is uh, that the other? Our, our hands are tied, really, because it's an OECD EU tax compliant. It's almost too compliant the way we've implemented it, which means that it isn't really workable. It's very hard to access it, so hence the, the uptake has been low. Um, there was one other change of note on the corporate tax side. Uh, he did tweak an interesting tweak to our intellectual property regime. This is the regime that grants companies tax allowances for IP that's brought into Ireland. The change he brought in yesterday restricts and effectively restricts um, what you can do with those allowances and a potential clawback 
of allowances. Thankfully, it only applies to IP acquired after today. Um, and that's important because huge swathes of IP have come into Ireland over the last couple of years with the abolition of the double hour structure. There's very little of that yet to come in. So the vast majority of the IP that has come in won't be impacted by this. But so it, it is a disincentive though to future IP mm. coming into Ireland. And IP tends to be more and more so associated with jobs. So it is, it is a negative and just you know, my natural instinct is I don't like to see IP, the IP regime has been such an important part of attracting key multinationals and retaining them in Ireland. I don't like to see any tweaks to regime that has been very successful. It just makes me nervous. Mm, interesting, all right. Jim, um, the, the whole warehousing of, of, of tax uh, obligations is, is very useful to, to businesses generally and has been, and the extension of that warehousing housing, uh, facility to, to self-employed people who were due to, to not just to file but to pay income tax o over the coming weeks. That, that's a big bonus, isn't it, the, the extension to, to that cohort? Yeah, I think many people will be very grateful to see that particular provision in the budget. So the warehousing concept, as you know, came in in the July stimulus and it was only related at that stage to fiduciary taxes, which are POI and VAT for businesses affected by COVID. So they could warehouse those debts, park them for a period, they were allowed 12 months of zero interest, and then after that, uh, a low rate of interest, 3%, um, when, when they came to normal trading activity and were in a position to, to pay them off. So this one wasn't flagged ahead of time. What he has said, he's actually introduced two more taxes uh, to that system. One is where businesses using the wage subsidy have a clawback as a result of revenues um, compliance um, program. But he's also said that self-employed people who at, at the moment, as you know, will be f in the process of filing their 2019 tax returns, many of them will have an uplift in the 2019 tax that has to be paid off and also will be paying primary tax for 2020. So he has said that be if, if they're affected by COVID, then they can park those in a similar manner, put them into the tax warehouse for 12 months and after that period avail of the 3%. And in fact, Revenue have issued some guidance on it that the same will apply next year and that next year's balance of tax for 2020 and premium tax for 2021 can also be tax warehoused in the same manner. So it's very, very welcome news for self-employed who've been impacted by COVID. Big cohort of people out there, literally from Absolutely. one person, businesses, hairdressers, pubs, all of that, all. all I think so, yeah. It's a cash yeah. flow issue because they haven't been able to well, generate cash. He, what he said in his speech was that the reason why he was introducing this was because in the July stimulus, he introduced what he called um, accelerated loss relief for two contexts. One was corporates um, and the other was self-employed. Now, corporates who have huge machinery, rent, large payrolls and so on, you can see how they will generate very big losses during the, the COVID period. But a lot of self-employed people don't have that. So essentially their income disappears, yeah. but they don't have the cost to generate the big losses to throw back and free up a tax refund. So he was recognizing that particular position and he was bringing them within the tax warehousing. So I think it's a welcome introduction. Yeah, I think one that the... Uh, the accountancy and, and tax advisory uh, industry were, were lobbying very hard for, so good response there. Una, you, you expressed earlier, I suppose, uh, a broad disappointment on the lack of any movement on, on capital gains tax, but I suppose from on, on the positive, on the flip side, uh, they could have they could have tweaked or, or rode back on some of the reliefs out there, the capital reliefs, they didn't do so, which I, I presume is, is of, 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 of relief to you. Yeah. Uh, and also a little bit of tweaking on the EIIS relief. Um, the entrepreneur relief. The entrepreneur relief. Yeah, yeah, yes, sorry, the yeah. revised entrepreneur yeah. relief. Yeah, so this, um, just for the audience, this is um, your first million at 10% and the excess over a million at 33%. So there was actually a very welcome change in yesterday's budget on one of the conditions for revised entrepreneur relief for um, entrepreneurs getting these special rates, the 10% on, uh, on the first million, 33% on the excess. So the change that was made was that um, previously you have to have owned shares, at least 5% of ordinary share capital in a company for a period of, pr a continuous period of three years in the five years immediately prior to disposal. Um, yesterday's change, um, again, very welcomed, was that you now only have to hold 5% of the ordinary share capital in a company for a continuous period of three years at any time or at any stage during your ownership. So I suppose, why was this welcome? Why is this um, causing excitement amongst tax practitioners? 
Um, the reason why it was so welcomed and why it is an exciting change is because um, as a tax advisor, you would have always been very mindful of your minority shareholder. So your minority shareholder is your six to maybe 15% shareholder, 6% to 15% shareholder. So day one, they would have always qualified for entrepreneur relief, provided they satisfied all the other conditions of entrepreneur relief. But as time went on and the company expanded, um, there was share schemes put in place for employees. There was either investors coming in through equity investment. Their shareholding would have been constantly diluted and it could have come down to 4%. So then when they went to sell their company in about five or six years time, only owning 4% in the previous five years, they would not have qualified for entrepreneur relief. Mm. So this is a great change because now it means that you can do your investment rounds, your equity investment rounds, you can dilute um, your minority shareholder, provided they've always satisfied that 5% for the, the three years. Another thing that we welcomed it in um, is as well where you have um, rollover relief when you sell a company and you get shares in, a let's say, a PLC that's going in to buy it. Um, again, you would have gotten a small interest in that PLC. And again, you probably wouldn't have been able to qualify for entrepreneur relief when you sold it. So there's loads of benefits. Um, loads of benefits to the entrepreneurs, but the key thing is that they must have had at least 5% for a continuous period of three years. Um, it also means that you don't have these complex dilution clauses in uh, shareholder agreements or in SPAs. Now, I'm sure the lawyers will continue to have those complex ones, but it won't impact our tax as much. So a very welcome change. And um, mitigating some of your disappointment on the capital gains. And basis. mitigating some <laughs> of my disappointments on the capital gains tax. Uh, they could have gone further, mind you, but <laughs> that's for another, yeah, another I, day. I, I'd agree with you, and I think it, it, it was a positive change. I mean, yeah. it's interesting that there's been lots of lobbying over the last three years, lots of expectation that the entrepreneur relief would have been uh, approved to match the UK's regime, where they have a 10 billion lifetime limit, and then the UK slashed their, their limit from 10 now to 1. So they couldn't really. Uh, use that argument anymore. So actually the fear this year was that it would be axed. Yeah, or severely restricted, even brought in further conditions around the ordinary share capital or the working time requirement. So, yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, obviously good news that it, that it wasn't axed, but I think overall, if you're offering somebody a lower CGT rate of 20%, versus that, I think you've taken a lower CGT rate. So I think there's more disappointment on the fact that the CGT rate didn't go down than the improvements yeah. worthy as they are to the entrepreneur relief. Yeah. yeah. Gareth, uh, the old reliables. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the old reliables, um, and certainly, you know, extra excise being collected in regards to diesel and petrol, um, extra tax being collected in regard to cigarettes. So I think price of a uh, pack of twenty cigarettes has gone up by fifty cents. I guess no surprise, really, is it? No, it's the sixth, sixth year in a row that it's been increased by fifty percent, and it's more now a public health measure than a tax measure. Um, there is a concern, and there has to be a concern. I think in 2019, the revenue had a notional figure that they lost around 250 million to the shadow economy because of people buying on the illicit market. And that has to be a concern that a further rise, I think it's nearly 15 euro for a packet of cigarettes, is will, 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 will force that. Is forward. that mitigated in the short term and the fact that people aren't traveling and either buying duty free legitimately or else that a lot of the... <coughs> You know, a lot of the travel arrangements uh, that would have got uh, brought. Uh, I think. I think what we did see, in uh, certainly in the initial lockdown, was the guards uh, and cab did make a lot of uh, drug fines and and a lot of illicit cigarettes. So there was there was yeah. obviously then it was it was curtailed. Um, but I do think it's there. It is a market that's that's that is open, and I think they have to watch how much do they lose because of it. Where the cost benefit analysis, yeah, basically. Yeah. But um, Andrew, we started with you, and we might, we might wrap up this session before we go to a couple of questions uh, with you. Um, broadly speaking, you know, I think you, you, you started off by saying that they got things about right in terms of how much they, they, they threw at the economy, in about 18 billion euro, probably the same next year uh, on the basis of what we're anticipating. Is there going to be a payback at some stage? Do we need to worry about that yet? Because there's a lot of clouds on the international horizon, aren't there? There are indeed, yeah. I suppose you know, there's there are bills mounting up here, and I suppose at some point someone's going to have to think about how we pay for all of that. Um, I don't think we need to rush to that position. Um, and the best way to get to a position where where revenues are increasing is is to get back to a point where the economy was and and where revenues are flowing. So that needs confident consumers who can go about business in uh, safe and accessible ways and, and re-engage in the economy. It also needs businesses to feel confident to make investment and to, to trade freely um, when, when safe to do so. So I suppose the key uh, is to 
bridge the economy back to a point where it is thriving again. Uh, in terms of then how we go about paying for this, you know, I think that's um, we've been too quick in the past to maybe rush to we're all in this together. Let's have some austerity. I'm not sure that will fly anymore. Um, and so there needs to be some potentially smart thinking about how we go about recouping uh, government coffers. And you know, we can look at ways of if you've if you've been supported as a business through this, then you know when you're out the other end of this, as as we hope all businesses will be, is there an opportunity for a, a payment when they're thriving, a, maybe a one-off or a contribution in, in lieu of the support they received. There's also an opportunity potentially with um, household savings has has mm. rocketed in the downturn. Nobody, Those fortunate enough to have savings haven't had anywhere to spend their cash, so there's a mm. significant pot of money there. And, you know, again, is there an opportunity to look at how that some of that could be brought into government coffers as, as part of uh, repairing the, the uh, balance sheet? And in my more left-leaning moments, I think, can we not just have a whole big debt jubilee and go back to where we were in, in January this year across the globe? But I typically keep those thoughts to myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tremendous source of relief to me, Andrew, to know that there is somebody with left-leaning uh, sentiments in a, in a firm like Grand Point. <laughs> they don't get out often. <laughs> yeah, we, have a, we just have a couple of questions. Uh, people are slow to get their fingers on that questions and answer box. Please do so uh, as soon as you can, even in the, in the three or four minutes we have left in this session and certainly in the second session. Very easy there, that question uh, box on the, on the side of your screen. Please get them into us. But uh, I want from... Uh, uh, here and I'll throw it out to the panel and let whoever wants to take it on. If a self-employed individual avails of debt warehousing, this sounds like you, Jim. If a self-employed individual avails of debt warehousing for 2019 balance of tax and 2020 preliminary tax, can they still get a tax clearance cert? That hasn't actually been published. We, we'll get the finance bill soon enough um, and we'll get more thorough guidance on it, but almost certainly. Uh, it certainly is the case for businesses that are using all of the other July stimuluses that, that, that come in. Uh, for example, the existing debt warehousing. So once, and, and a, a condition of that, interestingly me, was that all tax returns must be filed. So obviously the exchequer needs to know how big the problem is, how much tax is being warehoused. Um, but they've said that once the business continues to file their returns, um, tax clearance will be automatic unless there's any, any other particular reason uh, not to get tax clearance. So if you need it for license renewal or whatever other purpose, you'll still get your tax clearance, notwithstanding that you have put some tax liabilities into the tax warehouse. Okay, that's good news. And then we have another one. When can we expect, I think it's been called CRIS already. This is the COVID restriction uh, s uh, support scheme. When can we expect CRSS revenue guidance? Now, I don't know what sort of guidance this questioner is looking for, but uh, this is the new scheme effectively that will, it's an advance on, on allowances, I understand, it's an advance on allowances that you might have claimed in any case for business expenses in normal circumstances. Um, but I suppose further guidance? Yeah, it's, it, well, as I said, the, the finance bill is due. Uh, it won't be very long before we'll have the finance bill. There is some guidance already out on the CRSS, uh, and it's confirming that it is cash up front because people were a little bit concerned that this was maybe some form of credit as opposed to an actual payment but it's immediate, so the first payments will be coming out in the month of November, mm -hmm. and it is actually cash up front. Now, one assumes that the businesses that will avail of this, that have the requisite turn, uh, downturn in their business that avail of this and receive their cash payments, will have a price to pay later on. So in other words, there'll be denial, probably of some form of tax deduction in respect of actual outgoings in relation to the business. Sometime down the future. We haven't seen the detail yet. Mm, but just as well, perhaps, to, to be conscious of that. I think so, there's, a, there's always a flip side. And we might just finish up with one last question. Uh, apologies if this was addressed in relation to the warehousing measures for self-employed. Could you give your understanding of will this attract any surcharge if people are warehousing? I think, I think that's quite clear, isn't it? The, yeah, the, the minister charges. specifically said no surcharge. And uh, what a lot of people wanted to know, well, what surcharge is he talking about there? Because we live in a country that has hugely penal uh, interest rates charged on over, overdue taxes. So Six a lot to eight percent. Exactly. So a lot of people would see that as a surcharge in itself. The questioner may be asking about the late filing surcharge with the return, but as I said, a condition of the warehousing is that you file on time. So mm -hmm. there won't be any late filing surcharge, and the interest will be zero for 12 months and 3% thereafter is what the minister has said. So we're assuming that the legislation will, will uh, confirm that. Okay. 
Okay, folks, I think we'll wrap up our first panel there. Uh, and thanks indeed for your questions. Keep them coming. Uh, that question and answer box on the side for our second panel. That was our first panel, uh, Budget 2021 and its immediate impact. And I think the broad, the broad import uh, that I picked up from there was very broad acceptance of the measures introduced, uh, particularly those support measures for, for businesses, try to keep as many people as possible employed, even if there are temporary downturns to that crisp mechanism. Uh, some slight disappointment, as expressed by Una there and others, uh, on the capital gain side, perhaps even a temporary measure to get the, oils, uh, the oil on the wheels moving there, just for people who, who wanted to sell on and, and get things moving to do so with a, with a lower tax liability. But other capital allowance measures uh, quite mitigating of, of that. And as Jarlath referenced there, I suppose perhaps they could have been a little bit more uh, progressive on, on, the, on the VAT reduction side and extended to, to other uh, sections as well, including the likes of car hire. But broadly speaking, a very positive uh, response and welcome to Budget 2021 and its impact. Now, without further ado, we'll move seamlessly to our second panel. What does this mean for the future? Uh, I suppose a slightly uh, more abstract uh, concept, but um, as you'll see, uh, broadly speaking, we have the same uh, panelists. We have Una, Peter and Jarlis staying with us, but we have two new participants and I'd like to welcome them. Uh, on my left is uh, Kim Doyle. And Kim, I'm told that you're the, the knowledge center in Grand Thornton. I don't know how you can rest easy with that huge <laughs> burden on your shoulders, but uh, we'll be talking that's to you about right. various aspects, including uh, the, I suppose, the very proactive relationship that's going to have to be involved with, with the revenue commissioners over the coming weeks. And then we have also uh, Brian Murphy on the whole area of, of, of uh, the financial services area and uh, what, what, uh, what's happening there. Um, Kim, I might come to you first just to get you warmed up in the new panel. Um, no mention at all of our high marginal income tax rates yesterday. I suppose not all that surprising, given everything else was, was, that was happening. It is this government's uh, pledge that they will reduce higher rates of tax, uh, our tax rates, income tax rates generally, uh, over their five-year lifetime if they survive that long. Do you think that's possible, given the likely emergency situation we're going to be in for some time? Well, I suppose, as you said, Vincent, um, it was certainly no surprise at all that we didn't hear anything from the Minister yesterday on you know, increases to income tax rates or, or reductions um, that would, I suppose, hike up or reduce the, or change the, the income tax landscape. In the current budgetary environment, we all know it's an extraordinary time. There just wasn't you know, the physical space there to make any such kind of broad income tax changes. And it was you know, very clearly signalled in the programme for government that there would be no broad income tax changes. Also, it was pledged by government pre-budget as well. So I think we were all you know, clear that not to expect much by the way of increase or significant tax changes. However, it has been signaled in the programme for government that at you know, some point they would consider the, you know, the marginal tax rate and particularly the top marginal tax rate and particularly the USE 3% mm -hmm. surcharge for certain income taxpayers. Now, yesterday and this year is not the time for that, but we would hope that at some point in the future, when the economy is you know, in recovery, that the government would revisit these kind of extraordinary high income tax rate, look again at the 3% surcharge with the intention of eliminating that um, USC 3% surcharge. And also we would like to expect, or would like to think that the government would consider again broadening of the tax base. So all these measures have been discussed in the past, not the time now, but hopefully at some point in the future when we're back in recovery, we will, this will be back on the table again. That USC uh, surcharge of 3% on anybody over 100,000 euro is seen by a lot of people as being particularly penal, isn't it? It is certainly, and it, it brings the kind of top marginal tax rate up to 55%, which is you know one of the highest in, in Europe, and certainly if you look globally as well. So we would hope that you know when the time is right, that that would be re revisited again by government. Okay, Brian, did the government forget the financial services sector? as well the financial services sector usually sees more uh, changes coming through in the finance bill so obviously that's due next week and certainly we would expect to see uh, some more matters that affect the financial services sector come through there so maybe a bit of the devil in the detail next week and a little bit more uh, measures uh, for us to consider at that point 
The one thing we did see, I suppose, is reference again to the commitment of the government to introducing the interest limitation rules under ATAD rules. Um, they was, uh, a, there was a chance, I suppose, that the, those rules would have come through this year. Um, due to, I suppose, the, the other matters taking prominence this year, I think the authorities have decided to you know, delay the introduction of those rules until 2021, something that was recommended by the tax strategy working group. I'm sure a lot of our audience will know exactly what you're talking about. I yep. don't. So you might just explain that a little bit. A absolutely. I suppose uh, the, uh, over, over the last, I suppose, seven, eight years now at this stage, we've seen extensive international tax reform driven initially from the OECD uh, and then the EU also uh, coming into to play in terms of trying to, I suppose, I use the word harmonise, not a word Ireland likes, but really trying to harmonise uh, international tax policy um, to ensure there's more consistency uh, from a jurisdictional basis. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of kind of complex measures have come through over the last seven, eight years, and one of those matters that is still remaining to be implemented in Ireland is interest limitation rules. Rules that will really harmonise uh, the ability to claim a tax deduction for interest payments um, based on different measures such as profit, essentially. So Ireland has a number of interest uh, restrictions in terms of deductibility in our rules and have had those for some time. But what we don't have one are ones that mirror the, the current EU requirements. Okay. We're required to bring those in uh, and the government are committed to doing it, uh, as they have been to all other international tax reform measures. Just wasn't top of their priority this time. J just, I think the, the view was taken that we had rules in accordance with the EU rules that were equally equivalent uh, and we had some leeway in terms of the timing to induce the ones that mirror, mirror the international rules. So there'll be due consultation I think over the next 12 months uh, and we'll end up with rules that meet the requirements of the EU within the time frame that the EU have set out. So that'll come next year uh, and that's something that, that we look forward to with interest. Jared, I suppose the big move yesterday on the VAT side was that reduction that, that certainly everyone in the, the broad hospitality sector was expecting from 13.5% down to 9%. But looking forward as we are now, um, and there will come a time when, when the government will need to start getting revenue back in again when hopefully we all get back to normal and trading is back to normal. Is there a chance that they could actually, at that stage, look not only at restoring the 13.5% there, but increase our our, our high our high level bat rate from 23 percent yeah so our standard rate is at, at 21 at the minute and um, temporarily until the the 20th of february when it'll revert back to 23 percent uh, i don't imagine i wouldn't foresee the revenue the revenue or indeed the department of finance saying that they're looking for a higher rate we're already at one of the higher rates within the eu so there's a broad range between the, the 28 member states going from 15 up to up to 27 28 so at 23, we're at the higher end. I can't imagine there would be a political will to uh, add it to, 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 or bring it up to say 25. 23, as I say, we're already at a higher rate. It used to be a, a, a misnomer that VAT was only on luxury goods. VAT's essentially on everything that, mm. that you buy. Um, it wouldn't be a, a, a good political move, I would have thought, to bring it up to, to a higher rate. We already have a number of changes coming down uh, in regard to uh, the VAT. There's a lot of changes in regard to how e-commerce sales are made throughout the, the globe um, and those measures will mean that anyone buying something from outside of Ireland will also pay our rate. So you know, it wouldn't be a sensible move to put that any higher than it is. Once the economy is back up and running and functioning, I think a 23% is, is, is high enough. There are other things that they could possibly have done you know, to encourage business. That, the, the cash receipts or the ability to pay VAT on a cash receipts basis, the turnover for that or the threshold is two million. They, they could have been uh, more aggressive on that and brought that up to five or even 10 million um, to help with, with cash flow. And remind me, are there any significant VAT changes as a result of, of, of um, what's happening in January with, 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 with Brexit, the UK becoming a third country? Well, there are, there, there, there's going to be massive changes. Um, and and if, you know, we're doing a Brexit seminar next week uh, on that. Um, we wouldn't have the time to go into all yeah. those, but there's going to be massive changes if we don't get a deal now. The EU are meeting the UK Thursday and Friday of this week. Hopefully. I, I, I wouldn't expect anything to come out of that, but hopefully there's at least an agreement to meet yeah. uh, later and that we will arrive at some sort of trade deal. Um, if we don't, then, then you know, particularly because we have two states on the island, 
there's massive implications for in terms of VAT and uh, excise duties and tariffs of products moving north south from NI to GB, GB to NI. So Brexit is is the elephant in the room. Una, uh, there's a, a broad feeling out there that there wasn't a move on reducing the capital gains tax rate for broad political reasons, and we have a coalition government with you know broad range of of views there, uh, including the Greens. Do you think that? to get some movement on that downwards, hopefully, that there may have to be quid pro quos given uh, by, by, by businesses in particular who'd like to avail of it, perhaps in terms of job creation or some, some other quid pro quos to get a lower rate of capital gains? Um, I yeah. see you smiling slightly <laughs> there. <laughs> um, I'm always talking about the Greens and how adamantly or uh, vehemently that they were against uh, reduced rates of CGT. We saw it when they tried to introduce it in the July stimulus package. It was actually the Greens that knocked it down. Um, and uh, again, that they're just anti-reducing um, uh, the CGT rate. Um, in terms of your question, I suppose, um, yeah, um, we will have to probably, for small businesses and um, family-owned businesses in Ireland, we probably will have to give some sort of balancing act. Um, but I would like to point out, Vincent, that uh, family businesses uh, make up 98% of the businesses here in Ireland. Um, they employ half of the private sector workforce already. Um, they encourage regional development, more so than the multinationals and the financial services to my right and left. Um, they do um, foster, um, I suppose it, it does foster the entrepreneurial um, creation, the innovation that we're already seeing around COVID and what has happened with a lot of businesses and how they're surviving through COVID. So I don't necessarily see that they have to give more than what they're already doing. Um, there is a certain element of that the relief should probably be enhanced. I mean, as P Peter articulated in our last panel, um, we did expect to see some more changes to the revised entrepreneur mm -hmm. relief. Um, we were hoping that the threshold would probably go up to 15 million, and that at least would give a good um, rate of tax for entrepreneurs who are looking to divest themselves or exit, um, or even just retire um, from their business. Um, but again, the reduced rate of CGT would have probably um, counterbalanced all that and we wouldn't have had to um, go messing with the reliefs. Um, so I suppose to answer your question, I think small Please. businesses do, <laughs> already do give enough um, and that the relief should be enhanced more for their benefit. Brian, you may have felt slightly sharp elbows there, putting your, <laughs> your sector of interest into the slightly into the shade. Um, just in terms of what would you hope to see in the lifetime of this government in terms of any gaps there to support the financial services sector? Yeah, I, th I think that what we'd like to see, I suppose, is, is the commitments that have been outlined thus far. And, and there's been some fairly clear documents issued by this government and the previous government around uh, focusing on continued growth in the financial services sector. Uh, Una's right. Our sector does employ far more people than, the, than are employed in the financial services sector, but the number of people employed in the financial services sector is growing and is growing quite rapidly. And if you look at the government's strategy paper, which was IFS 2020, and, and then the new one, which is IFS 2025, it does focus on employment growth in that area because that's what is sustainable. Uh, would have liked to see the, the speech yesterday just, I suppose, reaffirm the the commitment to that document, but the fact that it's not there I don't think changes the dial in that regard. Um, other things that maybe could have come through, and I, I'd certainly like to see over the next 12 months, is uh, more innovative ways to look at the, the, um, economic, the, the focus on the climate agenda. Mm -hmm. We obviously had measures which have been discussed already uh, um, around carbon taxes, but maybe go a little bit further and look at investment in that space and, and maybe encouragement for Irish investors to get more involved in that space. Some more incentives might, might be a great word, but uh, the country has a commitment to meeting targets in 2030 and indeed 2050. And I think anything we can do to enhance our ability to, to meet those targets uh, would be welcomed. And I think it would be great if we can get that investment from the Irish sector rather than relying on investment from international sector itself. Yeah, perhaps unlock a lot of that capital that's tied up in, in, in very safe havens but not getting much of a return at the moment. Peter, uh, you, you, you referenced the, um, the, the IP tweaks in, 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 in the, uh, the intellectual property tweaks in the budget yesterday. What other changes might we see on the corporation tax front in future budgets, do you think, in response to the changing international environment? Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to Una's elbow 
there first as well. Vincent. Left and right. Uh, yeah, left and right, um, with some stats. 78% um, of corporate tax and 45% of income tax is actually paid by, by multinationals. But <coughs> there are threats on that front. Um, and Brian's right, he called out the harmonisation. And things have, taxes have been harmonised in Europe. And indeed, the EU wants to harmonise everything to have their way, and that hasn't gone off the table yet. Um, so there are threats as to what might com what, what's coming down the road. And so on Monday, the OECD, we know what they're trying to do, which is effectively, which is moving the taxing rights away to, to market jurisdictions. And that is a threat to Ireland, as indeed are potentially changes in the US post-election. So they all do represent changes. They do dilute the benefit of our low rate. They do make it relatively less attractive to be in Ireland, but Ireland is still the lowest tax rate, so you're still better off in Ireland, just less well off um, as you were. So to that end, Una's right. We need to do, this is coming back to where we were at the start, we need to do more for the indigenous Irish sector, almost as a, as a fallback. Yes, it's great that we have a thriving multinational sector, but there are risks on that front, so we need to do more for entrepreneurs, which is why I think there was, again, coming back to the CGT point, CGT point a bit of a missed opportunity um, that we didn't do more on that, on that side of things. The small businesses do more for the regional development of Ireland than the multinationals or the large financial services, which was centred mainly, let's be honest, in Dublin or even in Shannon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more to encourage the regional and the overall development of yeah, Ireland. Which, which, which the government would be very focused on, I would yeah. think. I'd agree, and completely. I mean, there's not an awful lot we can do. I mean, we're, you know, what happens overseas often determines we don't necessarily have much control over that. A lot of the tax changes are forced upon us by the EU directives or whatever, but whatever we can control, we need to make sure we do it right. And in fairness, the government has been quite innovative, have increased the R&D research and development tax credit, which is very valuable credit, and made it even more beneficial for smaller enterprises, and that's what we need to do more of, to do more for the indigenous sector as well as the multinationals. Kim, we've seen um, both over the past year with some of the measures announced yesterday and probably into the immediate future, an increasing role for the revenue commissioners. Uh, probably one of the more efficient members of the public service, as we all know, to our benefit and to our detriment sometimes. Um, Jim, in the previous panel, referenced that you know this this uh, this uh, Chris uh, allowance maybe maybe you know taken off at some stage in the future. How how do you see that relationship between businesses generally, advisors like yourselves, and the revenue commissioners with this new very proactive role they have? And ultimately, will they have to come back looking for the money that they feel they're owed? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm smiling there to myself because I thought, you know, we were dealing with the twiz, then we were dealing with the e whiz, and now you've just said where you have a, a quiz, which is kind of is, is similar to what's coming up in terms of the Christmas season. So, <laughs> yeah, certainly we have, a, we have a lot of new measures and a lot of new acronyms, but back to your point in relation to the engagement, the relationships between revenue, the public taxpayers, and, and us as tax advisors. You know, that, that has always been their revenue administer, you know, the tax system on behalf of government. And um, we've always had a strong relationship with revenue on behalf of our clients. Revenue in, in recent weeks and recent months as we're dealing with a lot of new measures introduced specifically to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. As we have a more public front role, in my view, as in they're seeing, you know, they're out there a little bit more. There's a lot of more on the PR side of things in terms of how they are handling taxpayers mm -hmm. and working with taxpayers. and one of the key messages always you know we're hearing from revenue certainly over the last few months is that they are open to working with taxpayers kind of a, a sense that they're willing to sit down and chat through how best we can get you know your your tax payments in the tax still has to be paid but we have seen kind of a, an openness as to working with taxpayers and their tax agents and their advisors in terms of you know satisfying those obligations and that role yeah will, will only continue in terms of direct engagement on, on the measures we're already engaging with revenue on behalf of our clients on, on the TWIS. So this will be the temporary wage um, subsidy scheme. It's the first of the wage subsidy schemes that was introduced at the start of the pandemic. And what, what's going on now is revenue launched a, a couple of weeks ago, their compliance check. So this is really their checking those employers or mm. our clients eligibility to avail of the subsidy. So this is the first of the wage subsidy schemes. And there's been a lot of interaction and engagement with revenue on that. And actually, in fact, there's a tight turnaround time to respond to these revenues requests for information. We've like five days. So we're kind of just a close working relationship there to meet that five day turnaround time with revenue. I, I suppose it's important to point out that supportive as they are likely to be and, and wanting mm -hmm. to be, those audits will continue over time. It's just to be conscious of that. Certainly, yes. Like the, the employer compliance check I mentioned under the, under the temporary wage subsidy scheme, that is, we expect that, to, that will, that's ongoing. That will continue for a number of weeks, certainly, if not months. 
also there's a reconciliation process that a lot of employers are, are having to deal with now there's actually a deadline at the end of this month and that's where we just didn't need to check the subsidy that they claimed under this first wage subsidy scheme against you know what maybe they were entitled to claim because everyone was just grappling with a new scheme at the time we need to just go back and have a look and see did we you know all was claimed what was supposed to be and we have to engage with revenue on that and get some information to them by the end of the month the newer wage subsidy scheme known as the eWIS is referred to an employment wage subsidy scheme there is a built into that a self-review mechanism where employers themselves have to at the end of each month go back and look to make sure that they they qualify their compliance you know is, is up to, up to where it should be and also revenue have stated themselves that at some point in the future they will be carrying out a compliance check on this employment wage subsidy scheme that we're currently availing of now and as we've heard of yesterday this scheme is extended to the end of next year as well so when will these employer checks be carried out by revenue is not net yet known at this stage. Revenue themselves have said they come back with more information as to the format and how they will be carried out. But certainly they will be coming back, carrying out some sort of compliance activity, be it like check letters, audits, as you've mentioned, some sort of intervention. But certainly we will see it. And the other new measures that have been introduced are likely to follow as well. Claim that employees that have been in receipt of the, the various wage mm -hmm. subsidy schemes will have tax bills to pay at the end of this year. That's mm. got a bit of coverage um, and maybe mm. slightly controversial, but they do have to pay it and revenue have said quite helpfully that look, we can factor them into your tax credit certs and do it over a period of years. So it seems to be like a softly, softly practical approach, which again is a positive in terms of revenue engagement on this. Certainly that, uh, as you mentioned, Peter, they have, you know, revenue have stated and it is out there that they actually are even delaying the collection of the tax due on these wage subsidy schemes. Mm -hmm. Now this would be the temporary wage subsidy scheme because the, the, um, the current scheme we're in is tax slightly different, it's just going through the payroll. They're actually delaying it to um, not starting in 2021, but actually in 2022, and they will reduce the individual's tax credit, and then they're willing to spread it over if you need, if the individual required of up to four years. So that is something not something we would have seen um, much of in the past. So it's helpful that we have the deferral, but also then a further kind of four-year period to pay the tax on those yeah. on those bills. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps one more question to the panel. Please get those questions into us, folks. That, that to, for any member of the panel in the remaining 10 minutes or so that we have, Jonathan, we we knew, uh, or certainly it was it was. Um, uh, committed to that there will be this uh, yearly increase in, in carbon taxes. I suppose if they were ever going to renege on that commitment and take, uh, take an opt-out, it, it, it was this year, they didn't. Uh, the, 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 the increase it, it happened this, this, this year. Two, two questions, I suppose. Do you think it was good that they stuck to that so that people are now clear good times are bad, those carbon taxes are increasing? And secondly, the measures they brought in to try and wean people off big uh, gas guzzling diesel cars and, and trying to get them to change their behaviour and move to hybrids and electric have gone far enough yet? Yeah, well, I, I, I didn't think they were going to renege on, on the day, particularly with the Greens in, in, in as part of the, the coalition. Um, I think it's inevitable, it's well signposted that it is going to increase year on year until 2030 in terms of the carbon tax. I don't think the consequences of it, you know, on an incremental basis are, are severe, but over a period of time, uh, they will be. Uh, I think in terms of, say, then the, the VRT changes and the change to the whole regime, in terms of motor tax, uh, I've seen a stat saying that in terms of motor tax, only 12% only of, of motorists will be affected. Um, now, if there is any criticism in terms of the VRT and the new regime, and the new bans which they're going to introduce from the 1st of January next year. I have seen some criticism this morning from uh, the motor industry, and um, they do think it will add uh, an amount to the, the average price of, of a new car. Um, which it will, I presume. Which, which it will, and uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, so it won't necessarily be a, a, a significant uh, introduction of new revenue to, to the Department of Finance, but uh, the changes are a nod to the green agenda, so I think they were inevitable, um, and we'll just have to see how it plays out. Will it encourage people? I think it will encourage people to go more towards uh, the hybrids and, and the plug-ins cars. Just become, before we come to audience questions, Peter, um, we have a couple of, of uh, events, I suppose, uh, or, or processes still uh, planned for. We have a, a national economic plan due, which I presume will be very high level, but uh, that is due to be published in November, and there is a, a commission on taxation as well. Uh, they are opportunities, I suppose, given all the changes that are likely to happen on the international tax front, given the, the changed mm. environment that we may have with a different administration in the United States and, and, 
uh, and trade wars, and given the whole Brexit situation, they are platforms, I suppose, to, to get some forward-looking uh, thoughts into what parts of the economy we should be trying to incentivise through tax policy and how we respond to those changes. Yeah, and as I said, Vincent, the, you know, there isn't an awful lot. We're obviously actively involved in a lot of those negotiations on the international front, um, and, and an influencer. Um, but, you know, yeah, we obviously don't have full control, but we do have control over certain things that we talked about earlier that, that we can do around us, things like research and development and just making sure that the armory we do have is, a, is fit for purpose. And, and I think we're, we're broadly there, despite changes like the intellectual property regime, which may be not, ne not entirely helpful. Um, but, yeah, look, I think maybe it's about being innovative then in terms of doing other things. We're here in the city centre. Um, obviously, it's very quiet at the moment. Um, and, look, longer term, it probably will be. There will be... Um, there will be changes to the but way we all operate. is going to have to look at broadening the tax base. Well, it? it's going to have to look at things. It's going to have to. It will have to look at broadening the tax base. And, and Kim's right. I mean, this wasn't the time for that. There's lots of logic in it, but it was never going to happen. But maybe if we look at other things and just being innovative, premises, you know, just the nature of how both cities and suburbs will operate will differ. And maybe there are there is a place for tax incentives to try and encourage refits and, and you know in a different way of doing things. And that's being innovative. That's it can be slightly controversial because. Tax incentives have got some maybe unfair criticism in the past in terms of some of the old property reliefs, but there is a place for that. So I just think it's about being innovative and trying to refit the economy for the post-COVID world. Okay, we might just move to one or two of your questions that have come into us, and thanks indeed for sending them in. Um, no mention of changes to IREF or REIT regimes in the budget. What's your view on expected changes coming down the line in this area in the future? Would that be you, Una, or would that be me? I'll, 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 I'll take it. Yeah. So. <laughs> There, I suppose if you look back, there, there's been changes, numerous changes to, to the IREF and the introduction of IREF rules indeed, and changes to, to property-related fund structure tax release over the last couple of years. There's nothing mentioned in the budget. I suppose there could be tweaks, as there were last year, in the finance bill. Um, so if you look back 12 months ago, the authorities looked to close what they perceived as some um, loopholes in the legislation. Um, they may well have a similar uh, objective this year, so we wait to see what's in the finance bill in that regard. Just to be clear, I'm not aware of any loopholes. Just to put that out there. Um, <laughs> but th there, there may be some, there may be some <laughs> tweaks there uh, next week. Um, there is, I suppose, it is on the agenda potentially, or there's certainly rumours that uh, a kind of a relook at the Irish real estate fund rules is on the cards. Clearly, that's something that wasn't going to happen this year with the focus on numerous other measures. Wouldn't be surprised if there was something down the line in that regard. I suspect this one is for you as well, Brian, and, and, and you kind of referenced it earlier, I think. Are climate change initiatives too reliant on state expenditure with insufficient incentive for private investment? I guess that's a really good question, and yet yeah, we, we referenced it briefly earlier. Uh, in my opinion, I think it is a real opportunity for incentives. And back to the point that Peter just referenced, incentives may not be a, a, you know, the, the most polite of world to, words to use, but certainly with the focus on carbon uh, and energy and climate change uh, um, objectives, I think there is a real space for uh, incentives for private investment in, in that space. Uh, I, I would hope that it's something we'll see in the short term. Um, and I think it's something that could really ignite uh, a kind of a sea change, um, both, both financially, but, but the mindset change as well from a local Irish investment perspective. So uh, it's something I'd really like to see. Uh, one or two, I think, questions, uh, perhaps going back to the previous panel, but just immediate measure implications. Under the new CRSS, the Chris, is it true, as mentioned in some news articles, that there's a €2 million Euro maximum turnover threshold to qualify for the scheme? I've seen confused reports on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can take that if okay. if Please you yeah. want, yeah. and I'll, I'll defer yeah. if, if no, it needs to be. Um, the the information that we have from yesterday is from the minister's budget speech, and then Revenue did subsequently publish kind of a brief synopsis. So we are expecting, as Brian's mentioned, more detail in the finance bill. But what we do know from yesterday is. The, the level of the weekly payment is there is a talk about 1 million. So it's based on 10% up to 1 million and then 5% of an amount thereafter. So where you're hearing the figures 1 million and so on is in relation to the percentage in working out the actual weekly payment. Um, the other criteria is a the reduction in your turnover. So that's at least 80% or mm -hmm. you're, you're compared to 2019. So there's a comparable period as well. I'm not aware of a two million um, figure be mentioned. I've seen reports of 10% of on the first million and then 5% on the 
on, on the excess yeah. up to a balance of four, up to a ceiling of four, but okay. I'm, I'm not... I suppose, like, like yeah, what there I seems mean, to be confusion on that two million ceiling. Th there's certainly, a, I, there's a good few, you know, points I suppose we're, we're looking at and we will be watching the finance bill. It, certainly I will, um, in, in the finer details will be in the finance bill and we hope to see some guidance from revenue as, as was mentioned earlier on as well. I'm not sure, you know, if, if the other panels have other comments on it, but that's just from, from all I could read on it to late okay. last night, the first thing in the morning. Um, there is some conflicting, but we have the kind of pr clear parameters that set out by the Minister yesterday as part of his speech. Your grand thought and folks, mm -hmm. they'll be the first to know. We'll fin finish up with one just immediate one that I think is very easy to answer. Does the 2019 tax return have to be submitted by the 31st of October this year, so two or three weeks' time, in order to qualify for warehousing? Uh, I can take that. Unless You're on a roll, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> See, a bit of a time countdown. Um, just, just reading again, I, 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 keep, I know I mentioned again the finance bill and as we mentioned that, but we will be relying on all the details in the finance bill. But what we heard yesterday from the Minister, what we can see from um, guidance as published, brief guidance published by Revenue, that if strictly the, if you're filing your 2019 income tax return, if you could not pay and file electronically, so that's on the Revenue's online platform, the deadline is 31st of October, which is the end of this month. Um, if you could file, you know, if you couldn't do the payment, which a lot of individuals will find themselves in, their deadline would have been the end of this month. However, there is an extended deadline until the 10th of December for those who do pay and file electronically. And uh, indications are from the information available yesterday is that if you file and you warehouse your debt, you would have up until the 10th of December then because you could pay and file, but you strictly wouldn't be paying. You'd be, um, I suppose, reporting your payment due to revenue and then you'd be straight away entering into the warehouse scheme for that, that payment amount that is due. But again, you know, I'm, I'm going to caveat that heavily in that the details will be in the finance bill, but from my reading of it now, hopefully the 10th of December deadline should be available. I can see why you're called the Knowledge Centre, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we'll leave it there. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists, Brian, Una, Peter, Jarlath and Kim, and our previous panellists as well, Andrew and Jim, uh, for uh, their expertise and their time here this morning. particularly like to thank you for your attendance uh, and for your very uh, pertinent uh, and incisive questions. Thank you for doing that. And, thank you. and hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to see you physically again, uh, cross, uh, crossing our fingers. That's it from me, uh, Vincent Wall. But I'd like to hand over to Peter just to say a few concluding remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, and I'm not going to add, add anything. I think, Vincent, you said exactly what I was going to say, which is to thank you for uh, sticking to the timing. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to my fellow panellists. Thanks to everybody for participating. Uh, thanks for the, the Q&A. Yeah, look, it, the, 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 the benefit of having a virtual webinar is that we've had the biggest attendance ever, despite the fact that there weren't many tax measures in it. But we've still managed to run it out for, for an hour. Um, and equally echo what you said, Vincent, I hope we are meeting in person next year. Thanks again for participating. Thank you.